uh, good to have you back. I hope you enjoyed your time uh, with family, but now you're back with family. <laughs> uh, let's take a moment and pray. Our Father and our God, we, uh, I ask you to help me. Help me to be able to communicate effectively and truthfully your truth and what we find in your word. It may be a blessing and an encouragement to your people and may glorify and honor you from beginning to end. And that what we encounter in your blessedness today that we will take with us and it won't be just left here in a building, but that instead we will live it out throughout our life and each day that people may see you through us and come to know your son. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalm, which we have been in for over six months now. Um, and it's going to be Psalm 104. Psalm 104. The title of this morning's message is Creation or Big Bang and Evolution. So I kind of just put it out there a little bit. Uh, this is going to be a message that I have never <coughs> delivered before in all my time of ministry. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little, a little uh, reticent uh, in the way it will come across, but I pray that God will be glorified. As Christians, we start with Scripture as our ultimate truth, and then everything else comes after that. That includes science and everything must conform to scripture. We do not start with science or anything else and try to conform scripture to it. That's backwards and unfortunately what a lot of Christians have tried to do. Psalm 104 is a poetic presentation of creation. When Psalm 104 is read, along with other creation passages, we have God's rich truth about the universe, earth, and humanity. What I'm about to say I haven't said very often, and it's probably with fan, probably most of what I'm going to say today would be laughed at outside this building and would be... Um, uh, rejected pretty much outright. But you know what? That's okay. Anyone who believes the universe came into existence by what is called the Big Bang is wrong. All who reject that God created the universe by the spoken word, they're wrong. And all who believe that mankind came into existence through evolution, and that includes theistic evolution, are wrong. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to start with Scripture. And we're going to take a look at creation according to God. God spoke the universe into existence out of nothing. The term that is used is ex nihilo, which means from nothing. God is what is called the uncaused cause. Now it's interesting if you think about it, God did not even need to speak the universe into creation. God is God, and if he wanted to, he could have just thought it. But nevertheless, he did speak, and it became as it is now. Genesis 1.1, we find this. Uh, and by the way, you're going to need to jot down a lot of passages. Do not even try to get to them. Uh, I'll be gone by the time you get there. But what we find in Genesis 1.1 is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, unequivocally, in Scripture, 
God is the creator. We read this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. He, which is referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created. Now keep in mind, we're, we're taking Genesis in the beginning God, and now we're reading that Jesus is the creator. And the reason is because Jesus is who? He's God. Okay, just making sure y'all got that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, right there. Did you hear that? Verse 17. In him, in Jesus, all things hold together. One of the things that uh, molecular scientists have told us is that it is beyond them how the molecule does not just, just, just expand and explode, that there is some kind of dynamic that holds everything together. And what we find out here is that Jesus Christ, by his power, literally is holding the universe together because if he didn't, do you know what would happen? A big bang. And it would all go away and be destroyed. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, the Trinity is presented as creator when coupled with what is written in Genesis 1, 2, and 1, 26. See, I told you it's going to be used on a lot of scripture. In Genesis 1 and verse 2, we find the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, third person in the Trinity, second verse in the Old Testament, we already have him being referred to. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, listen to what we read here. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Right here, we already have an allusion to what we know from the rest of Scripture, the Trinity, is that God is one, but He is triune, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, when Moses wrote in Genesis the historic account of creation, did you get that, by the way, as to who wrote Genesis? The person that wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is Moses, as revealed to him by God. But as he wrote in Genesis the historic account of creation, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And that is what sets the foundation for everything, everywhere, for all time, in all things. Before anything was, God existed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend that there was something when there was nothing. But that God existed somehow in eternity past, and there came a time when God began time through creation. According to God, there is a chronology of creation, regardless of what man tries. And I have watched so many videos and read so many things this week about those who are in, I'm talking about scientists. I'm talking about people who Ge geology and mathematics and all these different guys who are Christian that affirm creation and I've also listened to a lot of people and it's all been on YouTube who try to debunk creation and, and, and to understand how creation came about other than the way God said it happened. But as we've already mentioned the chronology of creation comes from God regardless of what any man tries to affirm or, quote, prove. And so this is how the universe came into existence. Eight times in Genesis 1, 
it is written, God said. And out of nothing he spoke into existence. First was light. That was on day one. Then he separated the expanse of the waters on day two, which means that there were the waters below and a canopy of water around the earth at the same time. We'd have to go back into that long, long way. On day three, God formed the dry land and plants. On day four, the stars and galaxies, the sun and the moon. On day five, the fish and the birds. On day six, he created the land creatures, Adam and Eve. And on day, se day seven, God rested. And that's where we end up in Genesis 2, 2 through 3. And so that is the chronology of creation. Now understand and hear this. Every day of creation was a 24-hour day. And the reason that I say that is because of a Hebrew word, yom, Y-O-M. Every time in the Old Testament that the word yom is used with a number, it refers to a 24-hour day. We do not see in Scripture that days were thousands or millions of years. They were each 24-hour days. And so we have a record of how the earth came into existence. And by the way, uh, on day six is when I believe that the angels were created. And this comes from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, where it says, Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them, and so even the angels were part of the initial creation of God. Now, my grandson, and I get so frustrated every time I'm watching a science presentation and they talk about the earth and the universe being millions and billions of years old. I get frustrated to no end because that is not the truth, again, according to the scripture. It's almost like, well, here's what's happened. They have said it enough times with enough false science to just people just suck it in and believe it. And that includes Christians. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. I mean this as, as faithfully as I can, that after each 24-hour day, what we have is a young earth. And what I mean by a young earth is that it's about 6,000 plus years old. And that's all. Now immediately you're going to ask me why I say that, and I'm going to give that to you, and I don't have time to go through all the geological elements and how to all those kind of things that are just bubbing in my head I want to talk about, but we will be here until we come back to sing tonight. Okay, so I can't do that. But what I believe is that we find that it's about 6,000 plus years old, and here's why. The Bible gives us genealogies in the book of Genesis. And according to these genealogies, you know, when... He, he begat and he begat and he was born and he lived this long. There, there has been a, a gentleman who, uh, his name was Bishop Usher in 1650. He went back and said, okay, I'm going to calculate this out and find out from Scripture. Imagine that. From Scripture, how old the earth is. And so he began by counting all the begets in the Old Testament. He studied ancient Egyptian and Hebrew texts and analyzed how ancient calendars were cal calculated. And he came up with a date for creation. Now understand that the Jews, you know how long the Jewish year was? 360 days. How long is our, how long is our year? 365 plus. Because what happens once every four years? A leap year. And so we, we the, the timing in there is really interesting. But what he concluded after doing all these calculations, and you can look him up, his name is Bishop Usher, 
is that he concluded, this is so interesting to me, one weekend in 4004 B.C. He couldn't leave it alone there. That's what preachers do. They think, well, what a, let's get a little bit more precise. He came up with the, even, with the evening before October 23rd. Now, that's just funny to me, okay? I'm good with the 6,000 to with the 4,000 plus years. But what we have is that literally, if you do your study uh, faithfully, with the Bible being your accepted foundation of truth, and you try to bring science into it, you're going to find that God is right. Does that surprise anybody? Now, here's what we continue thinking about. Because I want to talk about the Darwinian fools. If you take God out of the mix, there are dire consequences. And that's what's happened. I can remember talking to my grandson several, several, uh, well, not several, but, but a, a little while back. And, uh, you know, I asked him, I said, uh, were there dinosaurs on the ark? I saw his little brain, he loves dinosaurs, his little brain going like this. And he said, don't know. And I said, well, it had to be because there were two of how many? Every animal. Plus, it didn't have to be a full-grown dinosaur. It could have been a newborn from the egg dinosaur. And then it talks about kinds, and we could go through all that. We don't have time. I'm, see, I'm, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit. But I want us, I want us to look at what, what is it about these people who, who choose to, to look at pure science without being informed by the Scriptures. What does God say? And we've gone here one time before when we were going through Romans, but i got to read it because God is true, and I can mess things up. But now listen closely beginning in Romans 1.19, Paul writes, and again, this is under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, which means it is eternal truth. Paul writes, what can be known about God is plain to them. Who? Everybody. Because God has shown it to them. God has not hidden who He is, what He is, how he has done things. He has revealed it. Let me keep reading. Verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, that means everybody, is without excuse. Without excuse for what? For knowing and believing in God's existence. Let me keep reading. For his invisible attributes, namely his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, there it is again, in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Nobody who has ever lived will be able to stand before God and say, but I didn't know. I didn't understand. You didn't reveal yourself to me. We have here, because we believe the Bible first, that what God says, I've revealed myself, you, you know my eternal attributes, and so therefore you do not have an excuse for not believing in me. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as, as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. People who reject God's creation for evolution or the Big Bang, I'm not saying it, Paul is, are fools. Why? It's because they're outright rejecting God. And how is this proven? Look at verse 23. 
They exchanged the glory of the immortal God, whom they knew, whom God revealed to them, for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creaking, creeping things. In other words, they let that go and they said, I'm going to believe what I want to. And then they've got all these different things that they believe because they refuse to see God. And do you know what God has, you know what God says here? He says, I've revealed myself. All you've got to do is look around. You can see my creation. But if you reject the evidence that I have given you, I'm going to give you up. You want to go that way? Go ahead and go. God does not force anybody to believe in him that does not want to believe in him. But what he will do is he'll give them up. And that means they have no hope. Now, from Scripture, again, that's where we're starting. That's our foundation as believers. We start with Scripture, and then we determine whether or not the evidence that people will bring to us is the same that will fit with Scripture. If it doesn't, guess what? Guess what goes away? Them. And so we accept it by Scripture. So from the Scripture, we affirm God's declaration in His Word that He is the Creator. And that not only that, we, we've already referenced it briefly, but I'm going to do it again with two more passages, that God has put knowledge of Himself in every person who has ever lived. There are two texts. One of them is Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 where it is written that God has put eternity into man's heart. There's, there's one guy, I, I own several, that's been open several over the years. But what they will talk about as they argue against the God of the Bible is that they're really kind of afraid of death. That there is an eternity out there. And they can't nail down what that is like. This means that all mankind since creation knows that God exists. Specifically the God of the Bible. As Paul affirms in Romans 20, uh, 1, 20 and 22. That we've, already, we've already read. I just want to bring it back up. It says that God's invisible attributes. Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. In other words, it's not like you can you walk out and you go, we, did, we, did, we know, we know within the depths of our heart, every person does, that there is a creator God. His invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. Now, let's take a breather. Everybody go. Okay. That is a very quick thumbnail of a lot of passages, and believe me, I have not even gone near into the depth that I would like to. We, we may look, no, we can't look at it tonight because we're eating and singing. We'll look at it again on Wednesday, on Sunday night. Um, we have what is written in the Word to prove creation. That's what Psalm 103 is. Now I want you to have one Psalm 103 in front of you because we're going to read through some of those passages so you can see it. What we find in Psalm 103 is a poetic presentation of the creation of God. And as a result of the creation of God that the psalmist is, is embracing and and, and writing down to be a part of praise, to be a part of worship, he gets overwhelmed. And guys, let me just tell you something. This is this should be the, res, the, the reaction that we have when we think about God. Yeah, I'm going to go there. Because I got convicted last night. I got convicted. And I've been convicted since last night. Um, isn't it interesting 
how people will pay money, good money, to go sit in a very uncomfortable seat with a whole bunch of other people in an uncomfortable seat in a big round place that has a cow pasture in front of you that is lined off with numbers, talking about a football stadium, and how passionate we, we get over what happens out there. We buy in so much to what happens on that 120 yard field. You've got 10 yard end zone, 10 yard end zone, 120 yard. We buy into it so much that some people cry if their team loses. They buy into it, we buy into it so much that if our team scores, we go fanatic. I did it last night. I went, yes! If I did that here on Sunday morning, y'all think I got charismatic. Just because a guy caught a piece of leather pumped up with air and took it from his opponent, we were happy. We were joyful. Now we can watch the game again and not get all worked up. Have you ever noticed that? See, I will be able to watch that game for the rest of my days and not get all worked up when the opposing team starts coming back and gets ahead. Do you know why? I know the end. Hot dog, come on, catch it, big deal. Watch this. Y'all have heard the five last words of a redneck? Hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> you know. And you look and you see all those people and how 99% of them were overly joyful and still are today. But that's not the way we are when it comes to worshiping God. I'm confessing. Look how many empty seats we've got. And it's a lot greater what God did than what a guy with a, a jersey did last night in the end zone when he took away the ball from the guy it was intended for. But there are a lot of people who aren't here. But hey, they're fans of God. They're fans of God. Let me tell you what fans of a team do. They support it. They'll give ungodly amounts of money. They'll do stupid stuff. I, I can't. They, they'll paint their faces up. They'll paint their bodies up. They'll act like absolute idiots because of a stupid game. And yet, people who call themselves Christians are staying home because. I don't know that God is as important to them. And that is what bothers me. Did we read Psalm 103 yet? Well, I'm going to quit preaching and start reading Scripture. <laughs> Look at how the psalmist starts off. Man, he starts off. He starts off in, in, in high gear here. He starts off. And, and I felt, listen, I, have, I feel guilty just reading this, but I start getting in the mood. I start getting into what's going on, what's happening. Look at it. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. By the way, I, I think that's a poetic description of how the stars and the, and the galaxies are all in movement. You know, they're moving away from us. We have seen that. He is talking about it in a, in a poetic way. 
And then in verse 5, I want you to see in verse 5 is proof that man cannot destroy the earth. Verse 5, he, talking about God, set the earth on its foundation so it should never be moved. Which means that the way God has made the earth is going to continue until he changes it. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood high above the mountains. What's that talking about? The flood. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. The mountains rose and the valleys sank down to the place you appointed to them. You set a boundary that they, talking about the waters, you set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. Now there may be floods, there may be uh, uh, tidal surges that come with a, with a hurricane, but what happens when that hurricane leaves? What, what does the water do? It goes right back. You know why? God said, that's, that's, that's where you stay. That's where you stay. Verse 19. God made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. Verse 24. O Lord, how manifold or, or abundantly are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I love this next part here. Verse 25. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you, I love this. Think about this with me. Which you form to play in it. You know what I think he's talking about there? Have you ever seen people that get in these little uh, boats and they go out there and they see the whales breaching and, and, and coming over? Have you ever seen uh, dolphins that, that if the boat is going along, they're taking off trying to catch the boat? They're playing. And that's what the, the psalmist is saying here. Look at verse 19. God, I've already said that, didn't I? Uh, verse 27. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. Jesus talks about this over in the New Testament where he talks about, look at the birds. They do not reap, uh, they do not sow, or, and they do not reap, and yet God provides for them. And so what he says here, they look to you to give them their food in due season. Verse 28, when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your, uh, your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. I, I, you know what that's talking about? Have you seen pictures of, uh, of that place in the Ukraine where the uh, Chernobyl? Have you seen pictures of Chernobyl today versus back when? If you look at Chernobyl today, the, the earth... It's what they call it, Mother Nature. It's what they call it. It's what God did. All the plants are taking back over Chernobyl. They're, 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 that's what happened. If you don't cut your grass for, a, for two years, what's it going to be? Hello? A jungle, pretty much. And that's what God is uh, saying through the, through the psalmist here in verse uh, 30. Look at verse 31. And so after he goes through all this, and he, he reflects upon creation. He reflects upon the beauty of God and all the things that God has done. He gets to verse 31, and what he does is he breaks into worship. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles. Who touches the mountains and they smoke. You know what he's talking about there? A volcano. That, he, he says, you know what? God did that. That's one of my favorite phrases. When I'm, when I'm, especially in football, and it's at night, and the moon is coming up. This happened this past week, and I can't help but look, but look at the coach and say, "You know, by the way, God did that." You know, there's been a rainbow a couple times. God did that. Last Friday night, it was raining in the first half again. God did that. You know why God sends rain to clear out the crud in the air? And among other things. Anyway, 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 move on. Verse 33. So what is he? After, after thinking about all of this and looking at creation and reflecting upon it, 
In verse 33, he says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. You see that? I love this part of his prayer coming next. May my meditation be pleasing to him. In other words, he's saying, God, help me to think on you. Help me to think godly things. Let it be pleasing to you. That's the biggest battle. I told y'all that was it was between my ears. And, and he's saying here, may my meditation be pleasing to him. Why? For I rejoice in the Lord. Not that a team won or lost a game, but in the Lord. Verse 35, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. But then he ends it on a high note here. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. That's the way we should be, brothers and sisters. When it, no matter what else happens in the world, if we will set our mind and our heart on God, we can't help but rejoice by looking at creation and seeing all the things that he has done from a line of ants to the birds that are going to start flying south. It's so like my little grandson. When Pam and I were together. We were going somewhere, and it was in the fall, and there was a whole, what do they call birds when they're in a big group? Flock. That was a flock of birds. I mean, it was a big one that was going south. And our little grandson said, look, a bird parade. And so now every time I see them, guess what I call them? There's a bird parade. God did that. He put it in them to go where it's cooler, warmer, so they can have food and so they can mate and so they can have. It's like the whales that, that start off down in South America and then they migrate all the way up to, to the north to, to spawn. Guess why they do that? God did it. Have you ever seen the salmon? I, I, I used to say salmon until I was corrected. I understand now it's pronounced salmon. I just can't do it. Have you ever seen what they do when they're, 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 they swim all the way up, salt water, all the way up, and then they get to a certain river and they go, that's our exit. And they get in the river and the river is rushing. And what are those salmon doing? Buddy, they're going, they're kicking it with everything they got. And they're jumping over. You remember all the waterfalls? And they jump over the waterfalls and they go up. And you know where they end up? In the same place they were born. And is that a roll of the dice or is that the sovereignty, providence, and power of a creative God? That's what it is. That's the God we worship. And we worry about the price of gas. Or who wins a stinking game? Or, or whether or not you get a game on Friday night because, uh, see, I stopped myself. I almost confessed. And I've told y'all that a lot of stuff in my life ain't none of your business. And if I ever start doing it, Pam's already been told to sit down there and do this. But, but we need to look around and see God more often. You know what's going to happen when we see God more often? In our lives, we're not going to worry. God's got it. Who's going to win the election? God's got it. What about Russia and China and, and Iran and, and, and the war in Israel? God's got it, guys. We pray about it. We leave it in his hands. And what he does is best and right to bring glory to him. So what do I want us to do? I want every one of us to at least once today before we come back to singing eight is read Psalm 104 slowly, think through it, and realize that that is the God who saved you and the only God that there is who can save anyone else. Let's pray. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great indeed. You did set the earth on its foundations and it will never be moved. You made the moon, you made the sun, the stars, the darkness, the light. Your works are great in all the earth. 
You are the one that we all look to to continue each day and each breath. And so we do pray that your glory will endure forever and that people will rejoice in your works so that we may sing to you as long as we live and sing praises to you, our God, while we have being. And God, we do ask that our meditations be pleasing to you and so we rejoice in you. And we conclude this time by praying again as as Moses did, as David did, to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and to praise you forever. For it's in Christ's name, amen. Joel, number four. Four. Let's all stand.